Big thanks to the men of praise and to our choir for consistently leading us in, in worship in so many incredible ways, for bringing your gifts to, to before all of us. We're, we're grateful. Uh, to Bill for singing happy birthday to me. <laughs> Not grateful. Not grateful. No. No, thank you all. Uh, it, I thought I was going to, yes, it is 40. Thank you for pointing that out again, Jared. I pre, this, is, this is good. You guys are practicing encouragement. I'm glad that this is an encouragement. This is good. This is good. This is, I, yeah, I was trying to make it through Sunday without that. Like I had snuck through two services without anybody referencing the fact that it's my birthday this week. So thanks, Bill. Uh, it's good. Good, 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 good. Don't know what to do with that. Well, uh, we... we we have been in this series called Church Doesn't Have to be Scary, and, and, and we've been unpacking this reality that for many people outside of the Christian faith, the idea of showing up in a church seems incredibly intimidating, that there are these perceptions about who we are and what we do and what we believe that, that make this almost a scary place. And so uh, we've been talking about some of these perceptions and, and, and trying to figure out ways that we can overcome these fears and, and the way that Jesus invites us to overcome them. And so we're going to continue in that today as we uh, receive our scripture reading, Matthew 23, 25 through 28. I'll invite you to stand out of reverence for the gospel. Hear this word. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup so that the outside also may become clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside look beautiful, but inside they are full of the bones of dead and all kinds of filth. So you also on the outside look righteous to others, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness." This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And as you're seated, I'll invite you to pray with me this morning. Gracious God, as we open your word, we pray that you would open our hearts, that we might follow you with everything that we are, that our lives might come together in a real way. Pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture reading is not exactly the most exciting one that we want to hear. Nobody really likes to start a uh, sermon using the word hypocrite really loudly. Like no, Everybody kind of uh, understands that we don't enjoy that as a concept. We don't appreciate being called that. We don't uh, appreciate the idea that other people might think that of us. Uh, but that's the reality that we have to struggle with this morning. Now, during this month of October, there is some truth to that reality. There is some truth to uh, all of us kind of begin to think about costumes and, and putting on masks. Isn't it funny? I, at our house, we love dressing up. Uh, now, we being like our whole family, we have a themed Halloween costume for the whole family. Like we all go all out on this because we believe if we're going to go to somebody's house and ask them for free candy, we at least should have put in some effort, right? And I believe the same thing about kids who come to my house. Like, don't show up at my house in a, just a, a bed sheet with eyes cut out of it. That doesn't count. You got you to you really dress up. Now, uh, uh, for, for family time, my, my kids are all for this, all three of them. But, you know, my kids are different and unique in their own ways. My oldest son, Caleb, he was never big about dressing up. He, he didn't do a lot of make-believe. He was really practical. He was into all things kind of like cars and, and mechanical. He really enjoyed that sort of thing. He, uh, he is our truth teller to a fault, like whether you want to hear it or not. Uh, he is pragmatic in a way that makes me proud and crazy all at the same time. Uh, he is unfortunately a lot like me. Uh, I pray for him every day. <laughs> uh, then my daughter, Selah, she, uh, she's just got the big heart. She, she only liked to, to dress up as one thing, a cowgirl. And that's, that's all she's ever been. And so she, today, even today, she would wear boots, jeans, and a cowboy hat each and every day if we would let her. Like, that would be her ensemble. She would just go everywhere like that. So she didn't really do a lot of make-believe play. She didn't do that sort of thing. She didn't dress up for fun. Uh, she just dressed up as what she wants to be in life. 
Um, and so she's got good direction and focus. Now, my, my youngest son, uh, many of you have met and you've heard me talk about him. He is my imaginative child. He, he, he just thinks about things on a completely different plane uh, in a completely different way than any of my other kids. And, and sometimes I'm not sure what to do with him. Uh, you, you may have seen him recently at Wednesday night suppers. He's, he's been wearing a red cape uh, with a raccoon drawn on the back. Be- Here's why. Because he is the president of a raccoon club. Uh, it's a club that he started and made himself the president of. And it is, it's, it's a very exclusive club. You have to be invited into this club. But he, I, not, there's some nights I think he really believes he's a raccoon. Uh, you know, he, he talks about climbing raccoon trees and doing raccoon things. And he wants to go in the woods and find a raccoon family. And some nights I'm like, go on. But he really likes to dress up, and whatever he's into at that moment, he is 100% committed to. So I just want to show you some of the, uh, the, the other things that Micah has been. Uh, for a while, he was Sir Micah, the knight, right? He, he had this lovely knight costume. This was after we went to uh, Medieval Times over at Sugarloaf, right? And, and my, my mom went with us, which is great. I love having my mom along, and then she buys my kids things that they don't need. And this, this costume specifically came with a wooden sword. I was so thankful for that. I can't express my gratitude for the number of times I got hit with a wooden sword during the Sir Micah days. So Sir Micah went on for a few weeks, and, and that, he was fully into that. Uh, we've done lots and lots of Star Wars. Uh, and so his commitment to Star Wars has been epic. Uh, for a long time, he was a stormtrooper um, and, and would come down ready for school in this, <laughs> was going to go to school as a stormtrooper, and we were like, no, 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 you have to like, just wear normal clothes to school, and he's like, these are my normal clothes. I mean, he would wear it all day long, and this was a summer phase, and so, I mean, the kid would just sweat, but he refused to wear anything else when he was Stormtrooper Micah, um, and so even when, even when Darth Vader told him to stop, he just didn't listen. Uh, he, he was also Chewbacca for a little while. He has this mask that, again, my, I love my family so much. I think my brother got this for him. Have you seen this before? It... it it makes noise. So he would come to dinner with this on because he was Chewbacca, and he couldn't take it off because then he wouldn't be Chewbacca. So that's, that's, that's all we'd hear at dinner. Wouldn't eat, he'd just make noise. So fully committed to Chewbacca. The, the longest phase for him was, was his Pirate Micah phase. Now, Pirate Micah had a whole ensemble. Um, I mean, you know... R- r- like red coat, everything, soft sword, uh, jewelry, he had treasure boxes. We still have treasure boxes in his room that, that came from the Pirate Micah phase. He was so committed to Pirate Micah that he had friends in school that just referred to him as Pirate. They thought that's what his name was. <laughs> Not Micah. It was one little friend at school that would just say, if he was at, wasn't at school, she would say, where's Pirate today? Like that, that Micah is all in on, on, on costumes. He's all in on dressing up, and he, he really takes on those personas. And some of us dress up. Some of us put on masks. Some of us do these things each and every day without even realizing it. I think sometimes we, we wear costumes more effectively than our kids because people don't even know that we're wearing costumes. They don't know that we're pretending to be something that we're not because we're so good at pretending. What's fascinating is that we don't think that people know that about us. But statistics tell us that people outside of the church look at us and they think, oh, those people are just pretending. of of people surveyed outside of the church, when when asked what they think about, when they think about people who are people of faith, Christians, they describe us as hypocrites. 
85%. It's a lot. And that doesn't feel good, does it? As it hits you, it doesn't feel good to think of yourself as a hypocrite. It doesn't feel good to think of, you know, nobody wants to be Milli Vanilli, right? Nobody wants to be lip syncing and pretending to be something that they're not. We don't like this idea of hypocrites. We don't like the idea that somebody would think that we're wearing some sort of mask, that we're pretending to be something that we might not be. That's literally what hypocrite means in the Greek. It it means an actor. Somebody who pretends to be something else. If you want to research these statistics a little bit, if you want to look further into it, all you need to do is go to this Instagram account uh, that these guys started called Preachers in Sneakers, okay? And that's a, it, it's exactly what it is. It's pictures of preachers in sneakers or other shoes, really, really expensive shoes, you know, like, like $800 shoes. And, and, and you know, the, the, the comments below these pictures show everything, everyone's perception. Comments will be, you know, I can't believe they've spent so much on shoes or this jacket, and, and, and there are poor people in their community, and, and just on and on. They, they essentially say that, that what we say doesn't line up with what we do. Just in case those of you are wondering, my shoes came from Kohl's. I paid for them with Kohl's cash. I love every month when that thing comes in, I get to pull the sticker off and 30% off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but there seems to be this, this, this cultural perce- perception that in some way our lives don't line up with what we say. In other words, our, our orthodoxy, what we believe, doesn't necessarily line up with our orthopraxy, the way that we live and people see that, and they, they struggle with that, and so they use this word hypocrite. And, and let's be honest, in some way or another, all of us are hypocrites in life. People who levy that against us and the people who, who are, have it levied against them. I mean, we all have that friend who, who talks about working out all the time, but they never go to the gym. We have that friend who watched that documentary about eating organic, and so they're always talking about eating organic as they chew on a double cheeseburger from McDonald's. In some way or another, we're all hypocrites. We all put on these masks. We all hide these things about us that we don't want anyone else to know. We all have some hypocrisy in our lives. That's what Jesus speaks to in these verses. In fact, he spends the whole 23rd chapter of Matthew, really talking to the Pharisees, these, these religious leaders of his day, talking about their hypocrisy because they, they, had, they had set up all of these rules and all of these things that they thought brought them closer to God, but they hadn't moved any closer to God. They had just decided that those things that everyone saw were more important than what was happening on the inside. So they would wear, wear very ornate worship clothes with with long tassels that showed how very pious they were. Jesus goes on and on and talks about the hypocrisy of this, that, that, that these people were more concerned about what the people around them thought than what about God thought of them. And we get it. We do the same thing at times. Right? We, we wouldn't want any of the people that we sit with or any of the people that we're in Sunday school class with to, to know some of the things that are going on in our lives. So we put on our church face. Right? And we come in smiling, ready to be here, but not really be here. Sometimes we wear a mask in this place. Jesus looks at the Pharisees and says, you hypocrites, you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside you continue to be full of greed and self-indulgence. 
You must have seen the way that my children do the dishes. They never quite get clean. Jesus describes this internal life that needs to match the external life. The sense of disconnection that occurs in so many of our lives where it's just not contiguous. It doesn't match up. He goes on to talk about these, these whitewashed tombs, these, these places where people would bury dead bodies and, and they would paint them. And it started out as a very practical practice because in the Jewish culture, you couldn't touch anything that was dead or was touching anything that was dead. And so they would paint these tombs white so that people would know to avoid them. But as we do in all of our culture, right, we got we to gotta one-up somebody else. So these tombs became more and more ornate. They would look prettier and prettier. They would decorate the whitewashed tombs. And Jesus points out the absurdity of this. You're decorating the outside of something that holds death inside? Some of us live that way each and every day. There's brokenness and hurt and pain. And we hide it. And people see that reality. What they really want is people who they can believe. See, I'm convinced that there is a cure to hypocrisy. The cure to hypocrisy is simply vulnerability. It's the willingness to say, I don't have it all together. I I don't have all the right answers. I don't know it all, but I'm on a journey towards Jesus, and, and I'd love for you to come along with me. Here to hypocrisy is just being honest about who we are and where we're at in this journey of faith. I uh, had this seminary professor who was t- teaching a class on church leadership, and this is fascinating to me. This is such a part of our culture, this, this willingness to, to put up a, a bit of a front. And he was talking about church leadership. He said, he said, what's really important for you is, is you're going to get into these churches. You're going to be leading these churches. You're going to be pastoring these churches. You have to keep up the pastoral mystique. Essentially, you have to, to try to make everybody think that you've got your stuff together. I have a question, Professor. What if we don't have all our stuff together? Well, people need to see that. People need to see that you've got your stuff together. But what if we were just honest about that and we just said, sometimes I don't have all my stuff together. Guys, sometimes I don't have all my stuff together. Like if, if you need that pastoral mystique, I may not be your guy. But what you're going to get from me is the vulnerability, the ability to say, I, I struggle in some of the same ways that you struggle, that all of us struggle. And I have, I, I've got, two, like if I had like Adam's mission statement, I got two really things, two really important things that I, that I want to do in life. I want to help people live life to the fullest. That's what Jesus says he came to give us. I want to help people to find that, life to the fullest. And I want to shatter the pastoral mystique. We just don't need that. We don't need people encouraging other people to pretend to be something that they're not. What we need is the ability as a church, as a community of faith, to say, This is where I am. I'm willing to be vulnerable in this moment. I'm willing to say, this is where I'm at. I'm willing to look at other people and say, I don't have all the answers. I don't know all the stuff. I I, like I'm on this journey. I'm we're doing this together. And when we're willing to do that, 
All of a sudden, the walls of that, that hypocrisy argument fall in on themselves. Because vulnerability leads to empathy. People can understand where we're coming from. We can understand them. And empathy leads to life change. If you just look at the stories of Jesus, if you read the Gospels, you see this so clearly. Jesus looks at these Pharisees and says, you've set up all these things, but you haven't heard the most valuable thing that people have. You haven't heard their stories. And Jesus takes time, time and time again throughout the Gospels, to hear people's stories. Jesus, God in the flesh. Perfect. And people just pour their hearts out to him. You tell them about their brokenness and their struggles and their sins. They just tell Jesus these things. How would you like to talk to somebody who's perfect? Some of you frequently talk to somebody who thinks they're perfect. Jesus was this integrated whole. He knew who he was. So he's able to be vulnerable and invite other people to do the same thing. To create empathy and connection that allowed people to be who they are, where they were in that moment. My hope for us as a church is that we would be willing to do the same thing. Brene Brown, who studied shame and vulnerability, says this of vulnerability. She says, it's the birthplace of connection and the path to the feeling of worthiness. When we feel unworthy that we put on all of these masks, when we wear our church face. If it doesn't feel vulnerable, she says, then the sharing is probably not very constructive. We have to be vulnerable and allow others to be where they are, to share their story. Because here's the truth, right? We know this. We sense this. People connect to people who are always real better than they connect to the ones who think they're always right. Right? People want to connect with somebody who's going to be real with them. Who's going to show them what's going on in life and be honest about what's going on in their lives. The cure to, the cure to hypocrisy is just vulnerability. And here in this church, we're going to create a place with such deep love, such empathy, and vulnerability, that people feel comfortable sharing the most important thing that they have, their story. And they're going to allow God to change that story. Because we were willing to be honest about ours. Now, as much as we don't like the hypocrisy word, a lot of us aren't really a fan of the vulnerability word. Let's just be honest. Nobody says, you know what I really want more of in my life? Vulnerability. It's dangerous and scary. But it has the power to change the perception the church in the world. We're willing to step in and say, we're, we're done whitewashing, we're done pretending, we're done putting on costumes, we're going to be who we are, we're going to love people well, we're going to sit in the mess as we follow Jesus together, as we all reach toward life to the fullest.
that we're willing to be honest about where we are on that journey. Let's step into this together. Let's be brave and bold. Create a place where people can be so that Jesus can move. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we admit that we haven't always gotten it right. That we've pretended that we've put other people's opinions ahead of yours. That we've looked around and said, I need to look good in front of these people. And so we've pretended. Our lives haven't lined up. What we say hasn't always lined up with what we do and how we live. And God, for that, we are sorry. Help us to live a life more fully integrated. One that moves towards life in the fullest. God, help us to be honest and vulnerable to those around us so that we can create a place where everyone can come and experience your grace and your love through Jesus Christ. God, if if there's anyone here this morning who's never heard that you long to connect with them and offer them life to the fullest through your son Jesus, I pray that they would make that decision here today. God, that they would turn to you They would say, I'm done pretending. I'm done putting on a mask. I just want to be who you want me to be, God. May that be our prayer together. As a church, we would be who you're calling us to be and nothing else. God, that we'd stop wearing masks, that we'd stop pretending that we would be your people, living life to the fullest together. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.